Oh, you ready? Ready? That's one. That's two. Nodding. I'll take that. As, okay, three. Yep, more are starting to nod. Don't nod off. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You ever thought about why Jesus told stories? You ever thought about that? You know, he came to reveal who God is, who the Father is, the kingdom of God. Have you ever, you ever wondered about why he tells stories? Um, I don't know if it's the way he created humanity or just, you know, our tendency or whatever it is, but, you know, I tend to remember stories best. How about you? You know, <clears throat> we're not all Bible quizzers in here. You know, they... they quote stuff, and it's got an address. And they got to know the address. They got to know what book, what chapter, what verse, and they got to know the address. Well, for the rest of us who maybe don't do memorization like they do, um, you and I, we remember maybe what book it's in, maybe what chapter, maybe what verse, or roundabout there. We don't always know the address, but we know what we've read repeatedly, and we do remember it. But, you know, when it comes to the life of Jesus, or we look at the history of biblical characters and what they went through, man, history is so important. It gives us a story. You know, it gives us an account where we can remember. We may not know the full address, but we remember the person. We remember what the, that group of people went through. We remember how God intervened and what God did. I mean, we may not know all the details of, of Moses and the Ten Commandments, but we remember, you know, he was with God's people, and they went through the desert, and they got out of Egypt, and God brought them, and then here's the Ten Commandments, and, you know, and we might be able to recite most of them, or you might be able to recite all of them, and, but you remember these things things, and it goes through the Bible, and you remember what happens with King David and the prophets, and you go back to Noah, and you don't know all the details of the story, but you know the point, and you know there's a rainbow, you know there's a promise of God, and you know, we go into the New Testament, here's Jesus, and he just, he tells stories. There's a, there's a, practical, there's a practical reason that he told stories. Many of the, the audience that he had they were poor. They were not educated. But they could remember a story. I want you to know that it's really seldom for us to remember everything that everybody said. But you can tell a story about when you were with them. You remember that. You know what else you remember? You remember how you felt when you were around them. You remember that better. You remember that more than what they probably said to you. Oh, there's things we remember that they said. We can quote certain things that really impact us, but you, you can remember stories. You look at Jesus, and he was a great storyteller. And in his stories, he would tell you what the Father's like and what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then out of those stories, people got the understanding to, to know God better and, and how to live here in this hard life according to kingdom principles. You know... I've, had, I've been here long enough and been around ministry a fair amount of time and uh, had the privilege of being at different places and the privilege of speaking at different locations and travel a little bit. And, you know, I have people come up to me from time to time or send me a message and just... Uh, They tell me, yeah, there's been this impact, but they couldn't remember, like, you know, every message and everything I said. But they could tell stories about 
that I told or stories of when we were together. And they remember that, and it impacts them. You ever, you ever get together with a friend you haven't seen maybe for a long time or talked with for a long time? I, I have some friends like that. There's a friend that, I don't know, the every time we get together, and this is like years and years in between, I don't know what it is. We, we relive some college stories. It's the same stories every time we get together. But we still laugh. We still remember. We still value the friendship we had and the, those things that still keep us connected. Jesus told stories so people could remember. Causes us to remember what he did say and what the purpose or moral of the story is. Jesus was constantly saying, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And then he'd tell a story. They didn't all, they didn't all have one of these. They were in current living history when some of this was going on. So grateful that God inspired by the Holy Spirit for people to write down these things and record these things. And we know it says books couldn't record all the things that Jesus did. Just couldn't even contain it. I want you to know the importance of his word. The importance of the history, the story. Teach us how to live, teach us how to know God. There's a big move in our country to remove history. Maybe you've heard that in recent days. How sad to remove history. But it's just the beginning step, possibly, of trying to remove this history. If they remove this, they come for this. Are you going to just be upset because you live in the United States and you have a constitutional right and you a liberty and a religious freedom that you have. Are you going to just be upset politically? Let me ask you something. If they removed this right now or from your life, one, would you notice? In other words, I'd be upset politically if they took, took our Bibles and we can't have Bibles. But not having it, would there be any change in you? Because maybe you don't read it now when you have it. So why not take it? You understand the point, right? What happens if they try to remove your history? Biblical history. Do you know it well enough to re remember a lot of it? Will you remember the stories that teach you how to know God and live for God? Can you repeat the stories to tell somebody else? Have we hidden his word in our heart that we might not sin against him? How much does his word mean to you? I don't mean sentiment. I mean Jesus holds the words of life. Where else are we going to go? Right? Right? So his disciples said. You know, stories. I'm telling you, we better know the stories. We better know the history. Whether they ever come for this in our lifetime or they don't. 
we know that his word shall never pass away. And it will always bring fruit because it's living and active. Are you able to recite and know the history, the stories? Your kids, your grandkids, your friends, they remember stories about you and stories you tell. How many of them are biblical? I used to joke around with my son Brock. There was truth to it, but it came across in a joking manner. Man, when it, when it came, to, this is years ago, when it came to Star Wars, we, we could be in the truck going somewhere. And he could tell me, I, I'd ask about, you know, oh, this Star Wars because he was interested in Star Wars. And, you know, don't throw stones at him because he was interested in Star Wars. Okay, just, you know, it, you watch this Star Wars and watch this one, and then he knew what order they were in I, because my understanding is the order that they were made are not the actual order that they in. They jump back, and then there's other Star Wars stuff, and then some of it he calls as canon or what people call canon, but there's stuff that's not canon, and I'm just like, whatever, and who's this person? Okay, well, yeah, okay. The white, the white uniform, those were stormtroopers, right? I mean, that's where I'm at. Real base level, okay? Um, it, you know, and we... And then I, I would listen to him talk about this and all this knowledge he'd have about it. And I was just like kind of blown away. Like, I don't know, could you make a business about knowing all this stuff or whatever, you know? Man, you know so much of it. And then I said, okay, now, and I didn't interrupt him. I said, okay, now walk me through the Bible. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, and you'd get a little ways, and then I'd have to say, well, you missed this part. I think this would be important to know. And, and so it turns to this great conversation, because he could tell me all about Star Wars, but he couldn't walk me through the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament. Kind of those points, and who was then and now, and what was the purpose and overall view. And we just... It turned into a really fun thing because then I got to tell him stories and people and what God did and why I would mention them in the order as we read it through the Scripture. I've told him a lot of stories, and he can tell you a lot of stories. He heard about me or been with me or... But did I tell him any Bible stories that he would remember, that he could read, and why it was important? You see, if they ever, they ever come for this, I want my kids to know it. I love that I watching them pass it on to my grandkids. I get to see it. And not just in the stories, but the way that they live. Still growing in their faith, still making mistakes like the parents, grandparents do. But stories, stories are easy to remember. And Jesus told stories to reveal God and the kingdom of God. And I want you to know those stories. I want you to read those stories. I want them to become so impactful on your mind, your heart. That in the middle of your day when you're out of cell service and you don't have your Bible handy, you're able to remember it. That you don't just have to Google it or thumb through the page. You, you know it. Still good for us to do that, but to not be robbed of his word. That the words of life for us. And the words of life that come out of us that go and they, they are seeds that fall on people. You know, I want to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, he writes. In the last days, there will, there will come times of what? Go ahead, say it. Difficulty. Peril. Terror. Call it what you want. 
all kind of meaning the same thing. There's going to be times of difficulty. I've watched these times of difficulty in the recent year um, create a lot of worry, a lot of panic, a lot of tailspin for people for different reasons over the last year. I, I got, you know, and people, I mean, Christian people, just they're praying, they're asking God, then it's like they didn't get their prayer answered, and we'll talk about all oh, the prophecy wasn't fulfilled according to them and what they wanted and what they thought, and, you know, and they just, and it just consumes them and troubles them, and, you know, what's going on? And they get so down and so, so depressed and so enthralled with all of this. And I'm not saying we shouldn't care. Of course we care. But I don't, I don't, why are you surprised? I mean, what, I don't want to say what Bible you've been reading, but man, what Bible you've been reading? (laughs) And it's not all gloom and doom, but there's going to be difficult times. Well, there's a great time coming. Hallelujah. I believe still in this life, whether I'm around to see it or not. But certainly the next life, or what we call the next life, or shedding ourselves of this body and getting a new one and being in his presence, there's going to be difficult times. Am I crazy about having difficult times? No, not really. I'm, I'm like you. I'd, I'd like it to be easy. I'd like it to be, you know, all pro-Christian. And, you know, I'd like, man, I'd love all that. But, you know, we'd probably take it for granted and squander it and, you know, not prophesying bad things about us. I've just been around me long enough and humanity long enough and human history long enough. But, yeah, there's, there's going to be difficult times, you know, and you, you look through this list for people will be, and it just lists a, oh, all the, I'm telling you, just you got to read it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I mean, they're lovers of themselves, they're deceived, they're going to deceive others, it's treacherous, it's reckless, it's swollen conceited, lovers of pleasure, they got their own agenda, you know, all this stuff, even stuff that appears to be godly and it's not godly and they promote like God and yet they're godless and don't, such a disconnect between who God is and what he's like and what they say and how they live and decisions. I mean, he's just saying, hey, these are going to be difficult times, this is the stuff that's, that's coming, And here's the thing. This was not brand new warning or brand new news. God, he's been been through the King Ahab's and Jezebel's and Nebuchadnezzar. And, you know, he's been through some really evil leaders. And there's a whole list of them in Kings, in the book of Kings. And, you know, and then he's been through the ones we would consider good too. He's been through the Davids and the Moses and, you know, these different leaders through time and through the different prophets and uh, false prophets and, you know, idol worshipers and those who followed him. And, you know, I mean, he's been through, listen, he's been through the Pharaohs, he's been through the Caesars and the Herods. What this country's going through, it's not new to him. And he has seen his people through. And I'll tell you this, he's purged a lot of them along the way. Hallelujah. Just say it. Hallelujah. And it's not judgment on them, it's hallelujah for our own life. There's difficult times. He's been through this. He's dealt with these people. And I want you to grasp this purpose, this, this lesson. And we like good leaders. We like, you know, moral leaders. We like, you know, because we have faith in Christ. We like, you know, uh, Christian leaders, moral leaders, those who do right things and make good decisions. We, we like all of that. But I got to tell you, none of them are going to save you. None of them are going to save you. If it was about being a political leader, then Jesus would have showed up as a political leader. 
And they were looking. Their, their Savior, Messiah, in their mind was a political leader who's coming to. But, but, but God's like, listen, the, the governance of this world, though it's important and he uses it and puts people in place to carry out his will and purpose. And many times you and I have questions about his decisions. Like, weren't you listening to the prophecies? Listen, it's easier under some than others. You agree with some and you don't agree with others. You agree with some of what they do and not what they do. Listen, there's only been one perfect person who ever walked the face of this earth and his name is Jesus. And when he came, there was a bigger problem than just the temporary shifting politics of the world. He came to save those who were lost. We're talking eternal things. Some of it, it changes our temporary life. You know, this life we live is temporary. It's th this life as we know it, you know, I don't know if anybody's told you, but unless you're around when the rapture comes, you're going to die. It's temporary. We are here like grass, <laughs> and we wither away. Right? This life matters, and it's valuable. And what we do here matters. But a leader of any country or committee or whatever level of whatever, they're not going to save you. And I'll tell you, we can get caught up in being really pleased or displeased with the leader in the point where we're so much in favor that it's borderline unhealthy, like almost worship. And listen, we live, I'm, I'm glad to be in the United States of America, or what we still call the United States of America, and we can still vote, and we can still have the freedom of, of speech, though we feel the boundaries of that sometimes, and we can still petition, and we can still do peaceful things, and we should. We should. It matters. But understand that only Jesus saves, and he's got a way, way deeper, higher purpose than the troubles of the day that he has seen over and over again through time. You and I are so much on the clock, and yet he's the one that just holds time. There's a big difference. Now, this year, this week, this day, this month, this day, we're on the clock, man. God, he's, he's time. <laughs> Comes and goes before him. Listen. <clears throat> I don't want you to forget the stories. The history, what he says, what he reveals. We're going to read through the rest. Of, we're going to get to the bottom of Second Timothy three here in a moment. But before we do, you know, the times that we're living in these these kind of days, they're going to happen. And listen, you can blame the Republicans and you can blame the Democrats. In fact, Bladia, man, they're blaming the church. This is what we get. We haven't woke up. We're sleeping. We're sloppy. We're doing bad things. We're not following God. We don't pray enough. We don't. Well, did God tell you that? Or are you just prophesying on your own? Hey, does the church need to wake up more? Yeah. Do, do I need to probably pray more? Yeah. 
Do I probably need to memorize more? Yeah. How about you? Do you need to call on people more? Yeah. Do you need to share the gospel more? Yeah. Well, see, that's why this is all happening. Is that what God told you? Or are you just looking for someone to blame? He's looking for someone to blame. Maybe God is doing this because he's cleaning up his people in the church. Maybe he's got some other global purpose to fulfill that you don't see, but I don't see. He hasn't told me. Frankly, I haven't asked him. We'll talk about that in a bit, too. He's looking for somebody to blame. And maybe, maybe we're all to blame to a point. I don't know. You can have deductive reasoning. You can try to look at Old Testament Scripture and what happened there when similar things were going on, and therefore you take that and you throw it into the mix of our current day and say, Aha! See? Well, I I don't know that that's an accurate use of God's Word. You're just looking for some answer and you're looking to prophesy and you're looking to blame somebody and you're looking to whatever it is. And I'm just telling you, um, I'm glad you remember the story and know the history, but don't misuse this either. And are there principles from back then that we need to know and live by? Or when people were going through similar things? Yes. Is that JW? I want everyone to know. It's JW trying to man Marlene's phone. If you're in live stream, you maybe didn't hear it, but the phone was reading scripture to all of us. I think that was. I don't think it was a voicemail, was it? Okay. Listen. Um, God's dealt with all this stuff before. So, you know, here, I want to mention this. You know, there's people who (laughs) have these opinions, and I know they mean well. Man, the God's leaders, they need to start warning the people. They need to start preparing them for what's ahead and all this political stuff and social things and everything else. We need to hear those kind of messages. And thanks for your opinion. And, uh, I just want to tell you, if you have that all figured out, then um, go pastor church. Go ahead, go. And God be with you, and God help you, and God anoint you. But I want to tell you something. Your eyes are on the temporary. Because I look at what Paul writes here in this third chapter, and he said, these are the times that are coming. And then he lists why and what people are going to be like, what culture is going to be like, and all of that. And in here, this is now the apostles' answer to all of this. His answer to all of this comes back simply to live by God's word. Now, is there practical things you can do and you want to gather water and have food? And hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you know, you can go back to where people did that in the Bible and stored things up and it was hard times. I I get all that. But through this whole last year, you didn't you didn't really hear me talk about politics or or any of those things. I'm I'm called to I have been called to pastor and to, to preach his word. That's what I'm called to do. And I look at the Apostle Paul's 
writing here to this young pastor, Timothy, he said, listen, there's going to be difficult days. There's going to be perilous days. The people are going to be all over the place and wrong. And, and as he moves on through this passage, l- listen, listen to, to what he comes to. And he talks about all these people who just, you know, are doing their own thing, even some of them doing things in the name of God that's just wrong. And he just says, but they will never get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those of these two men he was talking about. Um, And then he says, "You, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my practice, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured yet from them, all the Lord has rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Do you hear that? Well, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted, some of them from childhood, have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Now this is how his transition is. This is his answer to all the, hey, this is, there's difficult times to come. This is his answer. They're like, we need to warn the church. Listen, if you knew the word, you've been warned a long time ago. And you have the answer. Then in the midst of difficult times and uncertainty and all this and unrest and whatever else, this is what we're supposed to know. All Scripture is breathed out by God which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God, the person of God, may be competent, equipped for every good work. Difficult times are going to come and go. But we're supposed to be people who are stable, secure, because we know the stories. We know his word which is here to correct me and instruct me in everything in life. How to know him, how to live for him. You know, I've watched some people really get all twisted up and turned around because they heard a lot of prophecies. And let's just be real open and honest here. Heard a lot of prophecies about who was going to be our president. And you find a few on one side and you find a whole ton on the other. It depends on what you heard or who you listen to or whoever passes stuff on to you and all this. And, and a lot of the prophecies were about our previous president maintaining office. And then it's unfolded, it didn't happen, and. Whew, Oh, there's Christian people. They're just worried. They're twisted up. They don't know. They're ready to call them false prophets. The people who prophesied, some are apologizing, some are not. Some are figuring other stuff out. They're just so wrapped. It's like, oh, what happened? What Bible are you reading? We're supposed to embrace prophecy but we're also supposed to evaluate it. That's what Paul writes. Now, now I want to I I pause here because if you just take all those who prophesied and it didn't turn out how they prophesied and now you're like, well, I guess they're false prophets. Ah, hold on. You're... you're you're going to move out of bounds here, and I don't want you to move out of bounds. Come back. Have you ever taught somebody something based on what you knew at the time? And later, sometime later down the road, maybe it was a day, maybe it was a week, maybe it was years later, 
you look back and you think, you know, that wasn't quite right. Or that wasn't the full training or full teaching. Uh, I've changed my mind about some things. I've learned some things. I've got greater revelation, better experience. How many of you have ever done something like that? You, you had to change your mind about what you taught or told somebody before. Come on, be honest. Raise your hand, please. You, you know, if you haven't had this, then I guess you're a perfect person because you have control of your tongue. God bless you. Be patient with the rest of us. There are things in my past that I have taught from his word. Based upon the, the measure of study that I did and the measure of what I've learned and who I learned it from. And years later, I gained more understanding and went, ooh. Not that there was something terribly wrong or evil about what I said, but it wasn't really purely correct. Does that make you or I a false teacher? What you've taught somebody in the past, you had to change your mind because you maybe learned some more, or you got better, or you expanded. Does, does that make you a false teacher? That does not make you a false teacher. You were mistaken. And part of it, or some of it, or all of it, you're mistaken. Didn't make you a false teacher. There are those who prophesy, and it didn't come to pass. Does that automatically mean that they're a false prophet? I wish this message could reach some of those people. Because they're probably condemning themselves, they're crawling in a closet, they're embarrassed, they're hurt, they're confused, they're in a tailspin, or they're trying to defend what they said now and twist it around or whatever. Listen, maybe, maybe some of the word was right, but the interpretation was wrong of what they prophesied. Have you ever said something that was true and somebody heard it and they went to repeat it but they misunderstood you ever have that happen <clears throat> have you ever done it see that doesn't make you a false prophet or a false teacher that's another category false prophet and false teacher. You know, it's interesting because we think it's prophecy. Well, it's either from God or it's not from God and there's no room for error and there's no, no making mistakes. And Well, do you notice that people he speaks through, they're human? And the people who hear it, did you ever notice that they're human? Did you, did you know that there were prophecies that God legitimately gave to a prophet and then what God spoke and intended didn't happen? Because it was a conditional prophecy? If they continue to do this, this is what I'm going to do. And then the people repent, and then that was never fulfilled. Does that make that prophet a false prophet? Listen, presumption plays a big part, and you can think, well, that's our word, that's not a biblical word. Really? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a little something from the Old Testament. It's in Deuteronomy, and uh, I just want you to hear this. And all the people shall hear and fear, and they're talking about the prophecy that's given. Now listen to this. And all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. They acted presumptuously over a word that came from God or was prophesied. And they acted presumptuously. They interpreted it presumptuously. Or they prophesied presumptuously. I want you to hear this. That happens. 
It's why Paul says, test it, evaluate it. I, I want you to know that um, Nathan, in 2 Samuel, he prophesies to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 3-5, through five, he has to go back and correct the assurance that he gave David. He had to go back. He had to correct it. This is Nathan. He had to, he had to go back. Listen, listen to this. The New Testament, the Apostle Paul, it's in Acts um, 21, and it's revealed to some other believers that when he goes, um, I believe it's to Jerusalem, and he goes, they know that he's going to suffer there. And it says this, through the Spirit, they urged him not to go. They were in prayer. It was revealed to them that Paul would go and suffer. They prophesied it. And then they urge him through the Spirit not to go. But Paul goes anyhow because God told Paul to go. This should be blowing your mind about prophecy. And your understanding of it. And how it works. And how... People prophesy and say things. <laughs> I, I gotta tell I gotta tell you this. This is this is just um first Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse nine. It talks about we know in part. We know in this life in part. But a time will come when we shall see and know in fullness. First Corinthians 14, he talks about, man, test it. E evaluate it. The prophecy. It, not everybody's coming out to be mean and wrong and to whatever. It, just we can sometimes be mistaken. Have you ever been mistaken? Have you ever been mistaken? There's prophecy and it's powerful and it's a gift of the Spirit. And it's to edify us and it's to build us up. But I will tell you that not every prophecy is from the Lord. And part of it might be, and then the human part kicks in and runs with some presumption on it. It happens. And yes, it's, it's embarrassing to us and embarrassing the body of Christ. And, and it can be embarrassing to, we feel like, to God and God's name. But just embrace the understanding that there are things that can be mistaken and we can be mistaken. And if we don't test and evaluate, then we begin to do some things presumptuously. And we have done a lot of things presumptuously. Some of us have done some things presumptuously in what we call faith. Therefore, if I say it, and I say it enough, and I pray it enough, therefore it will happen. Now, I know our words have power. And I know we're supposed to speak encouragement. We're supposed to speak truth, and we're supposed to edify, and we're supposed to comfort. And we don't like to hear negative and oh, don't affect the atmosphere with your negative talk. And I believe that there's an element of that that is very true. But I want you to know, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 37. Just because we proclaim something or a person says something doesn't mean that it's going to happen unless God ordains it, the Scripture says. So you and I can say things, and we can mean well, we can try to, mm -mm, and if I just say this, if I just speak this out, if I just declare it, and, and then when it doesn't happen, 
where people around you are like, what's going on? And they were a person of faith, and we all believed, and, you know, oh, and, and we said it, you know, and we just kept saying it, and we kept proclaiming it. As if that obligates God to then ordain it. It's just not true. Stop it. You want to prophesy? Speak his word. Hang on to his word. There are promises there that we can take and we can pray and we can do this, but at the end of the day, if it does not come to pass or God does not ordain it, the problem is not with God. The problem might be with us. The problem might be sin. The problem might be uh, we're withholding something. We're hiding something. It could be a, a sin issue. It could be a lack of faith issue. But maybe God just did not ordain it. And now it sends us into this big tailspin. Oh, and we're, oh, we're all messed up, and oh, how could this be? And listen, what Bible you've been reading? I believe in positive confession. I believe in proclaiming His word. I believe in prophecy. And I believe that when the Spirit of God reveals prophecy and we don't move presumptuously with it in our life, I believe it is powerful. It is from Him. It can, it can give us a gift of faith. It can give us direction. It can tell us how to live. It can tell about the future. I believe that. No question. I want prophecy to, pro I want it to prosper in this body of believers. I want you to desire the greater gifts, as Paul writes. But don't presume just because you're saying something and you know, going through the antics of it and, and you are sincere because you want it so desperately for yourself or for someone else or the church or whatever it is. But don't just think because you're saying it and you're telling everybody that you better know that God ordained it. And I'm not telling you not to make declarations of faith. But let them be based upon his word and upon his nature and who he is. And upon revelation of the Spirit. We're to grow up in the faith. I want to I share this, this last thought with you. And it's, it's from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 15. Jesus says something so powerful to his disciples. He says, you're no longer servants, you're my friend. And I will reveal to you basically the business of the kingdom of God. In other words, I don't reveal all this to servants. I reveal this to my, he calls them, friends. Let me ask you something. Why have you been seeking God if you've been seeking him? Why have you been, if you do, do you seek his kingdom first? Do you seek him for who he is? Do you seek him for his kingdom first? Or are you just constantly talking to him about world events and prophecies and you're just you're seeking him to find stuff out? Listen, I gotta tell you something about friendship. I've had a lot of people, I'm old enough now, I've had a lot of people in my life over the years come to me and act friendly and be nice and be warm. And then something happens in conversation with them. They start pumping me for information. I'm not offended by it. You just got to know something. You do that. You're not my friend. They are not my friend. I don't care if we hung out. I don't care if we did something together. I don't care that, you know, they put their arm around me and call me buddy and I didn't reject that and we've been friendly and I'm nice to them. But they start pumping you for information. Have you ever been around somebody like that? I am not telling them anything. Because they are not my friend. Now, there's nothing wrong through friendship asking somebody a question or whatever it is. I get, I get that. But there are people who pump you for information. And one, I find it real quick, that's not even their business. And they don't need to know it. And I'm not telling them anything. And I'm not obligated to. See, my friends, I 
They seek me to be my friend. They can be a friend to me, and I can be a friend to them. We're friends. And you know what generally happens? They don't ask. I'm safe and secure in who they are, and if it's a, something that's appropriate, I'll share it with them. They don't have to ask because they're my friend. They're not there to pump me for information. Why have you been seeking God in recent days? Just trying to pump him for information? Because he sees you coming from a long way off. Or are you seeking him because he's the Lord? And he's your lover. He's your master. Are you seeking him to be like him? Oh, Lord, tell me what's going on. Oh, what's going on with America and the world and China and, oh, the Oval Office and, well, President, oh, and the prophecy, oh, God. Now, I'm not saying we can't talk to him about that stuff, but, but listen to me. If that is what is driving us every day or most of the week and we're just so wrapped up, listen, I got news for you. He ain't going to tell you anything because you're not acting like a friend. You're just calling them up because you want something. This is a call today to return to his word and to know it and to live by it. And when difficult times come or difficult times cease, His word is the foundation of our life. And you declare his word. Declare it to yourself. You proclaim it. But don't conjure stuff up that sounds good to you, that somehow satisfies your need, and therefore if I declare it in the name of Jesus. Listen, that's to be ordained with God. And there are times that God has honored a prophet's word Hallelujah. Listen, you are a part. It's being written today. It's being recorded today. You are a part of church history. And when they write this part of history, and if God tarries and they hear about it down the road, what will they hear about you? Me. That they were founded on his word and they weren't blown around by every shifting voice or every tossing of the sea that brought turmoil and difficulty. They were prepared as a person who was a disciple and following Jesus Christ who knew the story. Why don't you stand with me, please? Don't mistake in the tone this morning as if I'm mad at you. Because <laughs> I'm not. And I'll tell you what. Truth. I'm always looking here first. <laughs> I, I, I listened to some of the prophecies out there. Sat and listened to them. Thought they were interesting. They affected me a little bit emotionally. Got my thoughts kind of going one direction or other. But at the end of the day, it's not like I was basing my life upon that. I was basing my life upon this. And I'm not telling you that you can't be grieved over whatever you want to be grieved about. Okay? I'm not telling you you can't. But don't let your grief become greater than your, your, your joyful hope. There, life, life in God is bigger than this life. And this life matters. And we should do our part as believers in this world. And we should do our part to exercise appropriately the rights that have been afforded us in this world, in this country.
But man, some of the divisive work that has gone on in local churches all over the place, over some of the stuff we've been going through, and all of a sudden that stuff was more important than his word? I feel so, so grieved over that, that believers made other things more important and where they disagreed than about their commitment and fellowship to one another in Christ. Man, they've gotten so deceived. Arrogant, their opinion. Listen, there's things I grieve about. I grieve. This is not casting stones, okay? But I grieve over the loss of sanctity of life in this country. I grieve over that. I'm upset about it. God's been through this before. Pharaoh killed babies. Herod killed babies. God is faithful and he's seen his people through. He'll do it again. He will do it again. He will do it again. He will do it again for you. I don't care what country you live in. I don't care what leader is over that country or your city or county or whatever. In the middle of difficulty, which we've been told that will come, what matters is how we live in it. And if we get off track on all this other peripheral stuff, it's going to consume you. It's going to take you up, and it's going to take you off the mark. Paul wrote about it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It be difficult times, and this is why, and this is how people are going to conduct themselves. But at the end of the day, his word. Hold to the teaching. Hold to the character. Hold to the virtue of his word above all things. Don't manipulate his word to satisfy your agenda. We do that a lot, don't we? I want this verse and I want this verse because this is the outcome I want and this is what I really want, so therefore I'm gonna, mm, mm, mm. Make your wishes known to God. Work at being a friend of his. And he's probably going to start talking to you about his kingdom.